class is now in session. I am Professor Hockey, and today we're discussing Game 47 of the regular season between the San Jose Sharks and the Los Angeles Kings, in which the Sharks have won 4-3 to in the shootout. And so, since Logan Couture's return to the Sharks roster a couple of nights ago, they are 2-0, and a perfect record, which I assume will, of course, keep up for the rest of this season. I see no possible arguments against that. But looking into this game, it was a bit of an odd one for Sharks. Sure, the Sharks would start off in the first period just getting absolutely caved in by the Kings, but not so much because Los Angeles were just skating circles around San Jose, but instead it was the Sharks who were making multiple unforced errors, allowing the Kings to generate tons and tons of chances within just the few first few minutes of that opening period. And it needed to be Capo Kakinen to step up and make tons of great saves for San Jose to keep this game tied at zero. However, once those first few minutes did pass, the Sharks began to wake up a bit and would generate a few chances of their own to equalize the shot counter. However, once we then got to the halfway point of the first period, that's when it completely flipped again for Los Angeles, this time not so much because the Sharks were playing poorly, but more so because the Kings are all around just a better team, really, and uh, the last 10 minutes of the first period were just entirely Kings dominated, and yet still a 0-0 game after 20 minutes again. Big thanks to the Sharks goaltender here for tonight for that score. In the second period, it went pretty much exactly like the first period did. During the first few minutes, some unforced errors by the San Jose Sharks, allowing the Kings to generate some great opportunities on net, but not actually managing to score. The Sharks, after those first few minutes, would fight back with some chances of their own, and this time, they would get the first couple of goals of the game, first of which coming from Zetterlin, his 14th of the season, as well as then finally William Eklund breaking out of his slump that has gone on for the past dozen or so games by getting a goal for himself to make it 2-0 San Jose. Then, like in the first period, the latter half of the second would be mostly controlled by Los Angeles, and they would finally get their first goal on the board past Capo Kacknan on a crazy shot from Trevor Moore uh, to make it 2-1 San Jose, and that would be the score at the end of the second period. Third period, guess what? pretty much had the same exact formula as the first two. Kings dominate at the start, and they get the game-tying goal for that, with a goal from Quinton Byfield to make it 2-2. The Sharks come back a bit over the next couple of minutes, get another goal for themselves, the go-ahead goal from Justin Bailey, before the Kings control the majority of the last few minutes. I will say the Sharks honestly did a pretty good job at killing things off, and they perhaps may have been able to even finish this game off in regulation, if not for a mistake from their goaltender, not because of the goal he let in, but because of the penalty he took as he sent a puck straight over the glass for the delay of game penalty with about 150 seconds to go, and it looked as though we would finally have a Sharks game where they don't give up a power play goal, but unfortunately, right at the end, it is a Drew Doughty power play goal that ends up tying this one up, so the Sharks penalty kill continues to be a nuisance for this team, and they go into the overtime tied at three, and in the overtime, there's a lot of the classic bringing the puck out of the zone into the neutral zone to keep up possession, something that I believe the NHL looks into uh, is looking into changing, which will hopefully make overtimes much more exciting, and five minutes would pass without a post-regulation goal, and so we would head to the shootout, and of course the Sharks this season in the shootout have been very, very bad. I believe the stat was that on 20 shootout attempts this season, they've scored two goals only, which is definitely why they've been winless in the shootout thus far, and yet with Couture participating in his first shootout for the San Jose Sharks, we know historically that Logan Couture is, an, is a very effective player in the shootout for the San Jose Sharks. He was the first shooter shooter for them as well, gets the goal. Fabian Zetterlin adds to it on a pretty much identical type of goal, which is likely why goaltender for the Kings David Riddich was so upset with himself after living in pretty much the identical two goals on the glove side over the pad, and the Sharks get the victory. Obviously, this isn't going to be the result that many people are necessarily hoping hoping for, especially when you consider the fact that the Chicago Blackhawks were also in action here tonight against the Vancouver Canucks, one of, if not the best teams in the league, and so obviously they end up losing that game, and as such, the Sharks find themselves just two points behind Chicago as they continue to hold a flimsy now lead on that last place spot. Moving on to the players to talk about, we have the top line of Zetterland, Hurdle, and Hoffman. Now, let us start off with Zetterland, who had an extremely effective game for the San 
San Jose Sharks here tonight was probably one of their best forwards on the game for sure. In the first period, I thought he made a lot of very solid plays, not just on the offensive side of things, but also coming back defensively multiple times on the back check to interrupt Los Angeles Kings attempts and scoring chances, which definitely is a sort of uh, an important balance to strike when you are on that top line. You don't just want to be contributing offensively, which he manages to do with a goal in the second period, but you also have to be responsible in your own zone because as a top line player, you're facing off against other top line players from the opposing team. So you got to be able to make those defensive plays and he did that quite well here tonight. Uh, when it comes to Tomas Hurdle, I don't think he was quite as impressive as his line mate Fabian Zetterlin, but Hurdle had a few good plays. Still probably not exactly what you're hoping for from Tomas Hurdle, but I guess it was okay. And then when it comes to Mike Hoffman, still ends up just being an enigma of a player. There were honestly a few really, really slick and smart plays from Mike Hoffman here tonight. Some strong stick work, not only getting himself out of tough situations defensively, but also just getting his stick in passing lanes and things of that nature. From an offensive perspective, he had like a couple of decent looks, a couple decent shots, had the shot assist sort of that would uh, eventually lead to the Fabian Zetterlin goal on that delayed penalty. But it was also a situation where Hoffman wasn't super apparent, at least when you compare it to the other winger on this line like Zetterlin. And in the end, he actually ends up getting demoted from the top line in favor of William Eklund, who I will get to a bit later. I don't know if that was necessarily a worthy demotion. It may just be in the exact situation of, oh, well, we wanted to promote Eklund and Hoffman ends up being a casualty of that because I thought he had a decent enough game. When it comes to the second line, though, we have Duclair, Couture, and Barabanov. Now, last game, it was Couture, Barabanov, and Eklund, and Eklund got changed off from that second line in favor of Duclair, who had been putting up a pretty decent game at that point on the fourth line. And so Quinn decides to keep these three players together heading into tonight's game, and they were definitely the worst line for the San Jose Sharks. There really just was not much doing at all from these three players. Couture continues to try and adjust back to the end. NHL speed. He was not particularly noticeable here tonight. Barabanov continues to do nothing pretty much for the San Jose Sharks. He had a couple of okay puck touches that led to essentially nothing. I remember one time in the offensive zone, he made a pretty nice move to evade pressure, and then an oncoming Kings player essentially just bullies him off the puck exceptionally easily, which allows the Kings to just get possession and eventually clear out of the zone quite quickly. It's just not really much doing from Barabanov. And then when it comes to Duclair, if you told me Duclair was not even playing in this game, I likely would have believed you. If people thought that the previous game from Duclair was a nice like wake-up call for him and the healthy scratch that he'd now suddenly become an effective player for the San Jose Sharks, this is the game that kind of puts a damper on that because there was just nothing doing here for number 10. This was just an incredible ineffective line in general for the Sharks. Moving on to the third line, we of course have Cunnan and Sturm joined by William Eklund. Now, William Eklund, an interesting story for sure. So, in the previous game, Eklund was dropped from the second line to the third line. I had a very, uh, I had viewed that immediately as a demotion. Of course, going from the top six to a third line position is just a textbook definition of a demotion. But in an interview that I read from David Quinn, he talked about how this wasn't a demotion. It's not a comment on how he has been playing recently, but it's an opportunity for Eklund to get a chance on the third line, which will face off against other teams' third lines and third defensive pairings to perhaps open things up slightly more offensively for himself and while there is definitely some logic to that I will say it's not exactly the flawless type of argument that it may seem to be on paper but I won't necessarily get into that for uh, at this point because I primarily want to focus on how Eklund did perform in this game which was at a very very high level. Eklund was one of also the best forwards for the San Jose Sharks along with Fabian Zetterlund here tonight and like I mentioned earlier on he finally broke out of his slump by getting this goal and you could tell just how excited and happy he was when he got that one a release of emotion at that point and what was most interesting to go back to that demotion interview from David Quinn is that after a strong first half or so of this game Eklund got promoted back up to the top line with Hurdle and Zetterlin so is it a demotion? Is it not a demotion, but instead just trying to get him to find a home on the third line? Or is it 
not a demotion, but you know you're putting him now on the first. Line. It's just a very confusing type of narrative here because you only kept him in this experiment for like half the game, and suddenly he's immediately back on the top line where he's facing off against the top competition that you wanted to avoid. It's just kind of mixed messages, I would say. Not that Eklund doesn't deserve to be in the top six for the San Jose Sharks. He absolutely does over players like Duclair and Barabanov. It's just definitely odd how we got to this point. When it comes to the other two players here, both Cunnan and Sturm had very much diverging games. In the first period, Sturm was a liability for sure for the San Jose Sharks. Probably one of their worst players in the first period. He made multiple uh, unforced errors. He was a major issue for them in the early parts of the first period. He gave the puck away, which allowed a two-on-one situation for the Los Angeles Kings. And then late in the first period, he gave the puck away again, which allowed for a great chance and great offensive zone pressure. And both of these giveaways were at high in the Sharks offensive zone, which is one of the worst places to give it away because your defensemen are just not usually ready to respond to a situation like that. And I tweeted out during this game that if Nico Sturm was like five, six, seven years younger, he probably would have been benched for the rest of the game because those are the types of young rookie mistakes that if a young rookie player were to make them, that would be, oh, well, that's inexcusable. That's something you need to learn. Oh, let's punish them by not giving them another shift. But since it's Nico Stur- Nico Sturm, he doesn't miss a single shift for the rest of the game, which I guess ends up working out at the end of the day because past the first period where Sturm was definitely a disaster. He looked a lot better as the game went on. The second period was pretty decent. The third period was actually quite good. So that was definitely nice to see. And when it comes to Luke Cunnan, as I said, diverging type of play from Nico Sturm because he actually was pretty solid in the first period. While he wasn't exactly the one uh, sort of the center of the offensive chances from this third line that obviously was William Eklund, he was making a lot of small, perhaps slightly unnoticeable plays that really helped that third line come together in those first 20 minutes of this game. And yet, as it went on, those plays became less and less numerous, and he ended up just not really doing much of anything in the last couple of periods, so that is definitely quite sad to see. And then we have the fourth line. It is Carpenter joined by Zadina and Justin Bailey. The probably shining player on this fourth line was Zadina, who I thought had a very strong first couple of periods of this game, had a couple of really good chances for himself, and it was just generally an effective game for the Sharks' fourth line. As a fourth line, I've mentioned this many times in the past, you're not exactly needing to generate like goals for your team, although Bailey scores one here tonight, a very important one, of course, by the end of it, but you just want to generate zone time, you want to generate pressure, you want to not be playing in your own zone, and I thought the fourth line did a pretty good job at that. All three of these players looked solid enough here tonight, just as Dino maybe standing out slightly more than the other two. Then we get to the defensive side of things. We have Ferraro and Vlasic. Now, this defensive pairing was looking pretty decent for the San Jose Sharks through the first half of this game. Obviously, there were many moments where the Sharks were heavily caved in into their own zone, as is expected against a strong team like the Los Angeles Kings, but I thought these two players did an admirable job defensively. Unfortunately for the San Jose Sharks, as has been the case for much of this season, they dealt another defensive issue in this injury, and this time to their top defenseman, Mario Ferraro. Now, this is not the first time we've seen Ferraro leave a game with an injury. It happened a few weeks ago, I believe it was against the Colorado Avalanche. And while he did not return to play for the rest of that game, he did come back right into the lineup for the next game on the schedule. Now, the Sharks play again tomorrow, so it would be a very quick turnover time, and considering the at least on paper, severity, how it looked in real time. I don't know if Ferraro is going to be able to make as miraculous as a recovery this time around, which does mean we may very well be in line for the interesting experience that I, the experiment that I brought up a few weeks ago, which is how the Sharks will adapt in a world without Mario Ferraro being their guy who eats up 25 plus minutes a night, because there isn't necessarily another clear number one guy on this Sharks roster. Really, the spotlight would likely fall onto Henry Thrun, and we saw on the first shift for the San Jose Sharks in overtime, Henry Thrun was the defenseman of choice for David Quinn, and I thought Thrun, outside of the top pairing, was probably the Sharks' best defenseman on the night. Uh, Ruda 
definitely lagging slightly behind Thrun, as has usually been the case of this defensive pairing. Thrun seems to always stand out in a slightly better effort, but still not too, too bad. The real issue for the Sharks defensively was definitely this third pairing. You know, Kyle Burrows, not a very good game, but I mean... Compared to Nikita Ohotyuk, he made Kyle Burrows look like Bobby Orr because Ohotyuk was really, really, really bad in this one. It started off immediately as the Sharks give up a 2-0 because Ohotyuk just allows two players right by him with just caught flat foot in that situation. It continued in the third period where he makes the very, very bad call to go right behind the net joining a couple of other players which just left Quinton Byfield available in front of the net completely uncovered which allowed the Sharks to get that tying uh, the Kings to get that tying goal early in the third period and then multiple other terrible shifts in the third period as well some bad giveaways behind the net where he just gets out muscled and out battled which is something that Ohatyuk is supposed to excel at as a bigger bodied defenseman and just generally a terrible ending to this game for sure for Ohatyuk not good at all definitely the Sharks worst defenseman on the night and then finally we have the goaltender Capo Cac that I mentioned early on in this one that with the Drew Doughty power play goal that was off of a mistake by Capo Kaknan but that was pretty much his only mistake of the night because he otherwise is really the only reason why the Sharks managed to get this game into overtime in the first place you might look at this and say well he let in three goals how great could he have possibly been this first period could have easily been like 3-0 3-0 Los Angeles, maybe even more than that if Kaknan wasn't really, really on his game. And so he gave the San Jose Sharks a really good opportunity to actually get two points here tonight. The Sharks actually ended up giving him a decent amount of goal support and it was enough to get the Sharks the win. He was also quite solid in the shootout, notably enough. But that would do it for this review. The Sharks will be back in action tomorrow. They will be taking on the New York Rangers, another very good team in the standings. The Sharks managed to beat up on the Kings who, while good on paper, have been struggling as of late. The Rangers will definitely be a tougher challenge, especially on the second half of a back-to-back. And with Blackwood and Net, we'll see if the Sharks are up for the challenge. Class dismissed.